the first item. And so our first item of business for this committee is to select a chair. And then we'll go back and do some of the other things. So how would you like how would you like to proceed? And a chair has to be one of the sitting board members. It has to be one of the three of us sitting here in this room. So I nominate Cheryl. <laughs> well, I was about to nominate you, Karen. And you, and I have no problem saying no. To <laughs> well, let me let me put my stuff right out here. I'm more than willing to do it. You're going to have to put up with a little fumbling around at the beginning. But it's if, up to you all. I'm going to be okay, a, if you're meeting. dying to continue. As I mean, it seems like you have enough on your plate. There's uh, a, a, some a lot of language there too. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's not going to stop me from playing the role that I'm playing and attending the meetings that I'm attending. So I'm going to be doing that no matter what. Good. I can encourage and invite you to join us as well. So, okay. what, how do we want to proceed with the nomination? There's two on the table. Well, I, I accept the nomination. Then I will second for Jill to be chair of the facilities committee and uh, pass it. Oh, maybe you should call the roll. Sean Eversley Brandon. Yes. Jill Tripp? Yes. Cameron Gilbert? Yes. Jill, all you. Exciting, thank you. Well, let's continue with our agenda. Thanks to those who voted for me. <laughs> um, now, it says we're, we're opening the public meeting, but that, of course, doesn't mean, doesn't mean public comment. I would think we, so. We didn't have anybody sign up, so. No, nope. all right. No one here from the public who wishes to comment? Then we'll move on to um, the facilities work session meeting. Uh, I guess that makes sense that the first order of business would be the approval of minutes from the 816 meeting. Do I hear a motion to approve those minutes? I move that we approve the minutes from 816. All right. Well, I'm abstaining from approving because I was not here at 816. I second. Any comments about the minutes? All in favor? Jill and Sean. Motion passes. And we move on to hearing about the GIAC Gymnasium. So anyone who's here to discuss that with us, move forward. Tim, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, so for those of you that don't know, I'm Amanda Burba. I'm the Chief Operations Officer for Ithaca City School District, and we have our wonderful um, community partners um, here with us this evening, both online and also in the room. Um, I'm just going to give a, just a quick overview. Um, we are revisiting this topic. So last year we spent a lot of time in the Facilities Committee um, discussing um, an opportunity for GIAC to be able to expand the gymnasium um, space that is uh, the Immaculate Conception, the old gym on their property. And uh, that required, at the time, the proposal was to try to utilize district space, right, that we would actually go to the voters to be able to um, have that approved to be able to be given to the City of Ithaca GIAC gymnasium. Um, that proposal did not pass, and so we're back to um, collaborating and to the drawing board and discussion and thinking about um, the you know all of the young people in Ithaca um, and the Beverly J. Martin community and the GIAC community many of which we share our families and our friends and um, I know that we have um, folks online as well who maybe could do a better job of sort of setting the stage as to uh, you know why this is a priority so I'm going to turn that over I believe uh, Leslie's online um, and perhaps even Travis. So, uh, Tricia, you're you're sort of the brains behind the, the online tool. So, I hope that's okay, everybody. Um, Leslie's saying she is uh, trying to log on and not able to do so. If you want to send me the Zoom invite link, I can get it to her immediately. Or if someone wants to send it, I believe it's on our agenda as well, right? Is that the Yeah. I will try to cut the piece right now. 
She may have to be let in as well, Trisha. I don't know. I think we're running this as a webinar. Exactly. I'm completely wrong. In the meantime, why don't we introduce ourselves probably to folks at the table while if I, I don't mean to interject. No, no, that's fine. <laughs> this is going to be hard. Jump to right in. Tell, tell, you're going to have to tell me to be quiet a number of times before, before I learn. I'm Lou Bell. I'm Tim Logan. I'm the Director of Engineering for the Department of Public Works for the City. I'm Rob Melmack, GIC Team Program Leader. Jill Tripp, Board of Education. City Schools. Karen Yearwood, school board member. Sean was school board member. And we're waiting for who to join us? Um, Leslie? Or? If you want, while we wait for her, I could kind of go through the first couple slides and just set the context for the project, and then hopefully she can chime in and she can add to it. So I just sent a series of slides over that we can just take a look at, make sure everybody's looking at the same place and thinking about the same space. So just to start out with, just an aerial view. In the top right corner is the main GIAC building with the gym next to it. In the bottom right corner is a BJM elementary school and a, play, a playground and the yard there in between. And then this building with a series of eight skylights here in the top left is the former Mecca Conception gym. So that's the building that the city purchased uh, through IHS after they bought the whole Magic Conception complex and have been redeveloping that. Um, what's next? I think a couple street views just to kind of see down from the street level. A perspective then looking back towards the playground is behind the tree in the middle. Jack and BJM would be over to your left. And the existing building here is on the right. I look less than later just in time. Uh, with a driveway that runs down the side of the what we're calling the new gym, I guess. And the fence line that runs along that driveway is approximately, but not exactly, the property line. It actually veers off the property line just a tiny bit. And we'll see that in some drawings in a little bit. I think the next slide is just another street view. Oh, no, we're going to go into plan. So maybe we'll pause there and let Les catch up. Or should I keep going? Are, are you with us, Leslie? Yes, I am. Thank Excellent. you very much. Um, Thanks for the link. Um, Tim was just starting to fill us in a little bit on the, the site. Do you want him to continue doing that, or do you want to make some statements before he continues? I mean, certainly Tim can continue and I can fill it. I can backfill how we got to, to this place. So there's continuity, if that's okay with everyone. Okay, that sounds good. Okay, so this is a drawing of our original plan before the referendum and the hatched out area is the existing footprint of the gym. The dark lines that surround it were the proposed expansion. So primarily on the top of this drawing, which is to the east, we were looking to expand the exterior wall out to about the property line. And the reason why is that it turns out that the existing basketball court inside the gym is not as big as the standard regulation basketball size. It's a little bit on the small side. So we're trying to get a full size court in there with just a little bit of the safety space around the edges. And there's a little bit on the street side, which is on the left here. You'll see just the corners are bumped out just a little bit to add a little bit of space, but it really stays within the city's property on the school district property here, or the, the city's property, the former Matthew Conception property. 
And there's also an expansion on the <coughs> south side of the building, which is on the right side here, which, but that goes towards INHS and on the property. The original proposal then was to have a main door on the Court Street side, but that walks through an alcove and then <coughs> walks through the basketball court before you got to the stands and the concession space and some of the other program and office and classroom spaces on the back side of the building. And because during events we didn't want people walking across the court, we were hoping to get an alternative door. So there's a sidewalk that runs down uh, on the top of that drawing with, and you can see a couple doors that kind of open up onto the sidewalk. And the main entryway of the building was going to be on the far right side. So you could come in, there'd be an atrium, there'd be a concession stand, there'd be room for people to gather and hang out and stuff. And then you could walk into the gym without having to walk across the court itself. But that would have required property, and that's what the referendum was about, was about purchasing some of that property onto the school district's land. Uh, I think the next slide then shows how we changed that. In the revised plans here, knowing that we couldn't have that space over the line, uh, we still are looking to expand that eastern wall to the property line here. And here you can see how that fence veers off from the property line just a little bit at the back side there. And so again, the hatched area is the existing footprint, that added shaded area around it is the proposed expansion. But, and actually that door on the far upper right corner is not correct, that's been changed since then. The building code doesn't allow us to have uh, doors and windows if we are right up to the property line. We have to be pulled back from the property line to have any openings in the building. So that door would actually have to slide around onto the right side or the south side of that building. So the building would be right up to the property line. The fence line veers away from that just a little bit. And you can see on the, on the bottom of the drawing, on the west side of the building, we would then put that uh, walkway and entranceway uh, on the west side of the building. So still an entrance off of Court Street, but the main entrance into the gym and uh, begin the entryway and, uh, into the concessions area and the rest of the gym would be on that far side. Um, I think in that same PDF, there may be another drawing or two that just show uh, sorry, no, on that same PDF, and just like page two or three of that. Uh, yeah, if you just, yeah, you're right. So there's just a floor plan of the inside of the building. This is the revised version. You can see on the on the right part of the left part is like the second story. It's up above, so you can kind of ignore that for just a second. On the right side, the big square. Uh, the doorway would be on the left, out on the Court Street. Those rooms that are on the front of the building are program space for. Print screen yeah, printing, um, a recording studio, a fitness facility, basically like a super souped up YMCA kind of feel for the teams. And this uh, is meant to be a team uh, complex, so we want everything that they're into, all the interests, garnered in one facility. So, and then those spaces, uh, there's a main door that goes into the basketball court. Those spaces could be um, closed off from the rest of the court, so you could just have access to those at night or on the weekends or whatever, or when you didn't want everybody else in the rest of the court. And then the big court, you can see the stands, and then the atrium and entryway, uh, locker rooms uh, in the back, utility rooms. Uh, there's one classroom space downstairs, and then there's a stairway that come upstairs to a few offices and two larger classrooms on the second floor with an overlook overlooking over the basketball court as well. And I think page three of that PDF might just have, yeah, some very preliminary elevations, which look like they don't came out there very well in our <laughs> PDF here, but just a couple of elevations to give you a sense of the building. This east elevation here in the top left, we're looking at a way that we might be able to recess a part of the wall to get a window in there because there's a classroom space up on that second floor and we didn't want it to have zero windows. So we're looking at maybe we can recess that wall and get a window in there. Otherwise, that wall is not allowed by building code to have uh, windows or doors. Uh, the south side, which is facing the INHS building, has a couple windows and a door. The west side, which is opposite from the school's property, would again have a, an emergency door kind of close to Court Street on the left. And the main entrance to the uh, gym would be in the back of the building there on the right. And then the bottom right corner is the front of the building off of Court Street there with the main entrance, et cetera. So that's kind of where the project stands. I think the next PDFs show the proposal. Oh, yeah, so this utility cross. So the idea is if we can build the building out to the property line of the school district, we still need some space, but it's only underground in order to extend utilities into the building. So the kind of recalculated idea we came up with is if you're looking from Court Street down that eastern wall, 
and you can imagine this is the concrete footer for the exterior wall. Everything to the left would be on the school district's property, but it would all be underground. So there'd be room for a little bit of a footer, there'd be a drain, there'd be room for some utilities, phone, internet, and a combined water and fire service that would head into the building. That would all be underneath where some of the garden spaces are for BJM. They would be temporarily have to be relocated. We dig down, we can put the pipes and stuff in the ground, and then we'd fully restore that when the project's done. When, when we're done, you would, a lot of people would never notice the difference. All the stuff would really be underground and the gardens can be restored back on top. Um, so the next two PDFs show that and more formally, one is the permanent easement, which the idea is in, instead of having to go back to a referendum, I think if you were to try to grant us a permanent easement, it still has to go back to referendum, if I'm not mistaken. So we came up with this idea, well, maybe we can swap with something we have of equal value. So on the bottom of the drawing would be the utility corridor for the new gym, and the thing that the city would give to the district would be at the top of the drawing. Sorry, let me just scroll down, it's at the top. And that would be in that driveway that goes along the existing GIAC gym, we could provide a similar utility corridor that would reach back to the school district property. And if you ever needed to bring internet or cable or water or sewer service or anything like that to the BJM playground or the building itself, you'd have a path in from Court Street. So that was what we came up with as a potential trade uh, in order to swap that. Um, so that's the proposal to, to do the swap for, uh, for a permanent easement. And then the last PDF is the proposal for a temporary easement because we're building this uh, a new exterior wall to the property line. We would need some room just during construction time in order to do that, make sure everybody's safe so we didn't have kids on the playground getting too close to construction. So that's a proposed 20 foot temporary easement on the order of a year or maybe a year and a half just to be safe, something on that order. We haven't set an exact time frame yet, but um, that would be the proposal for the temporary easement. So there's no setback requirement. There's no setback requirement on the side, correct, yeah. Because that whole area was done as a planned unit development with mm -hmm. Common Council. Well, I've, I've been, I'll just start off here and then I'll be interested to hear Les, Leslin's um, take on things. And that's that this is the first time I've understood what was wanted here. Um, I, I'm one of the many people who sort of reflexively voted no because I clearly did not understand what was being asked for. So um, this seems to me like a clarification, not a runaround um, of what people didn't want because I think what was wanted was very unclear um, when I voted. I don't know how what other people think about that. So. Uh, thank you for, so I, for a nice I'm explanation. Sorry, if we missed an opportunity before. Yeah, we're doing that. I don't right? know what what I was up to, Tim, but I clearly missed all of that because it seems like relatively little as it's being put forward here. So, anyone else have a want to have a comment on this before we move to Leslie? Before I comment, I would love to hear what Leslie has to say. Okay, over to you. Well, thank you, and thank you for allowing me to join you all remotely. Um, thanks everyone who's there. Um, in uh, just real quick history, um, we worked with INHS when Immaculate Conception School closed, the uh, diocese had reached out to GIAC, um, inviting us to purchase the whole facility. We obviously couldn't do that, but we were at a place where um, our after school program, because other after school programs were closing in the area, we were turning away many more children than um, we were used to turn away because we just didn't have the space um, to accommodate, especially our elementary age uh, students. So the idea occurred to us that since the school was closing and a parent actually, a, G, a parent who had children in the program, you know, told us about the closure and, you know, said, hey, you might want to think about some of that space for GX so that um, you can expand and have room for more children. What turned up happening is we, INHS uh, worked with us, INHS bought the property entirely, worked with uh, GX and subdivided, sold us just the gymnasium, gymnasium portion of it. We thought that would satisfy what we wanted. Um, nothing wrong with a gym, but I, I, I 
I want to clarify that it's more than just a gym. The gym is one part of it. And it really is a program space. Currently in our facility, in the current GX facility, we at one point could accommodate, you know, upwards of 50 teens at any given time in our program. Today we have one single room, and I don't know if Ramel spoke to this before I got here, a 12 by 12 room that's for teens. If anybody knows that's a population that we really need to keep an eye on. Um, unlike elementary age students, they can go home after school and so on and so forth. Um, but often that's not the case. So elementary age school age program has pretty much taken over the current GX facility. Still, we have about 44 people on our wait list because we can't accommodate those children and we have no room for teens. So when this idea came up, we thought what a perfect solution to move the entire teen program operation over to the facility and our job training program over to this new facility. We run HETP and we're looking to revive our CDL program, uh, training program and move those two over there and free up some of the rooms that the teens use. Now, there's one room that teenagers can congregate, but there's another room that the screen printing machine is in. We take that out of GIA, we can free up that room and another room that is used um, for, for programming, free those up and we can open up those rooms at GIAC for uh, the children who we continue to turn away every year because we just don't have the room. So that was the thinking behind it. It really was how do we benefit the community with this? Child care is expensive, child care is lacking, and we have an opportunity to try and increase um, child care uh, spaces for uh, community members. That was the impetus behind this project. Um, a lot of people have heard it's a gym, you know, it's a gym. It is more than just a gym. It is much more program space than it is a gym. Again, nothing wrong with a gym. I don't want to paint a picture that having a gym is a bad thing. The original plan um, was to um, get some of the space from uh, that's on the school district property to allow the entrance to be on that east side where the garden is. And we also thought about our neighbors because we do, we've been in lots of conversations with, um, with the former uh, principal of BJM, just what it would look like um, having a doorway there so that if by any chance BJM needed to use that space similar to what we do with the current facility, you can just get in the door rather than have to walk around and through and they can come across the playground, get in the door, the, the facility will be there. Um, like we do now, we open up that back door to the current GX gym, and if there's a need to shelter, if there's a need to um, house children for any reason, they just come in that door. So those were some of the ideas behind, or that's the main idea behind this project. Um, mainly sort of creating a space that looked like one unified community. The doors were there, the entrance was there, everything was within reach of all of us uh, at this point. Um, and as you saw in the drawings, moving all of the team program operations, the team classrooms, uh, BD bots, the screen printing that the team program do, uh, does, a lot of it for um, school district sports program, a lot of it for community. And it's also programs that keep many of our teams engaged in something meaningful and then we are able to at the same time keep an eye on them and encourage them academically most of those young people who participate in either or cooking team cooking program or bd box screen printing they take ownership it's team run they have an opportunity to it's, it's a job training they have an opportunity to make some money for themselves to learn a skill or several different skills, everything from marketing to, you know, you name it, 
to the actual uh, screen printing. But to participate, you also have to be keeping up with your schoolwork and keeping up with responsibilities at home. And that's one of the ways that we've been able to sort of keep these teens engaged. Everything that we do with GIA, we don't do it. If, I, I always say this, if I tell the staff we're gonna take on one more thing, they will probably have my head on the platter. But we think about it as, in general, as how is this gonna benefit the entire community? Not, you know, just us. It did take a lot of, you know, work to sort of figure out how do we raise this money to one, buy the facility, you know, so the nonprofit and a grant that we wrote, we were able to buy that. And now we're at the point where we were like, okay, how we then raise funds to do what we need to do to renovate it so that everyone um, within our area who needs to have access, I mean, of course, it'll be there primarily for GI program space. And as I said, for teens and middle schoolers um, who are above a certain age, and then the rest in the, uh, the other facility. The last thing I'll say very quickly for those of you who don't know, GIAC is also a licensed school age child care program through New York State Office of Children and Family Services. Being a licensed facility, because the after school program is our largest, or youth after school program, elementary age, the largest uh, program, a lot of the regulations that come with that limit some of what we can do in the current facility. And that is why we have such limited space for teens. We have to separate kids uh, by certain age groups. They, you know, like the peewees, the four-year-olds have to be by themselves. So they have to have a separate space with their own bathrooms and, and exit. And so there's a lot that goes into the thinking around it. I just wanted to share that with you all. And if there are any questions that I might not have touched on, I'm happy to answer. Thank you. Sean, did you have questions or thoughts? Uh, too many. I'm going to see where this conversation goes to see how I can put them all. Um, I did have one thing to say, though. Um, sure. We say teens, though, and it seems small. Teens is not like first grade. Teens is eighth grade to 12th grade. Yes. So that one little room, like she says, that I, I run for eighth and 12th grade is a lot of inspiration for the facility. So we do cinematography, we do docu-series, we do screen printing, we do poetry, we do art. That's all that stuff in a small room with kids from 8th to 12th grade. So then you go, all right, it's a gym, like she keeps touching on, it shrinks it. So if you don't say that we have a big projector in there for when the kids do their docu-series now, that they don't have to screen on a TV in a little teen lounge, they can invite their friends over to watch this docu-series that they just created or watch these videos that they just created on a big projector screen in their gymnasium. It's not just a small gym for basketball anymore. Um, when you say that we do cut and sew, and then we screen print on the cut and sew items, because that's what these kids are into in that same facility. It's not just a gym anymore. So when it was presented to everyone at the vote, it was just a gym. And it was seemed really easy for people to shut down the gym. Even though to me, I don't think that's a bad thing. I think a gym is a great thing for kids downtown because they can't afford to pay $12 every session at the YMCA. And it's also figure out how to get to the YMCA. And outside of the YMCA, there is no other gym besides school gyms that they can go to and you can't go to the school gyms. So where do they go? Ithaca weather, everyone knows Ithaca weather, right? It's nice when it's nice, but when it's not, it's not. So if they can't play outside at GI, where do they go? And that's not just teens, that's all kids, right? So then you go, oh, they can play school sports. There's 80 to 90 kids that try out for school sports. Then the kids that can't make school sports, where do they, if they just want to play recreationally, where do they go? GI's gym, anybody ever seen it, is about as big as this room. So it's bigger to support everyone who has these needs at that demographic that everyone complains about. Everyone's saying the teens are outside being reckless, they're being out of control, but realistically, there's nothing designed for them here. Nothing. You go to the mall here, it's designed for everyone but people their age. The commons is designed for college kids. Ninth through 12th grade is a forgotten age in Ithaca. 
unless you're playing sports, there is nothing for you to do. And then when boredom sets in, especially after something like COVID, mischief just comes with that. So trying to give them something to like strengthen everyone's interests is what we wanted to do. Like every kid doesn't want to play sports. So like the recording studio isn't just for music, it's for animation and all this other cool stuff that we had kids that come through and have these interests. So we want to have a place where kids who can't afford to pay the money to do these things can just do them for free with us, can learn how to do them with us, can be as creative and as free with their imaginations as they can be with us. And it hurt me a lot to hear the things, the talk. That's why I wanted to come here again, that it was just this gym that we wanted and we wanted to get rid of people's gardens and their classrooms. My kids go to BJM, one still goes, and every that whole community means so much to me because I don't get to leave it. I'm there from 10 o'clock in the morning to like seven, eight o'clock at night every single day. So the, and I see the different kids that funnel in, the different adults that funnel in, the little kids that funnel in and leave. So to see something get shut down that would have like really brought, I mean glistened, made our neighborhood glisten, it just hurts because it was a lot of energy without knowing. And a lot of energy without even taking into account the other kids that we serve. Like there's more than just one group of kids. And a lot of the kids that we serve are the kids that come on foot traffic to that place, to Chia. And I don't know, for, for me, I just wish people would think about everyone all the time when they make a decision and ask questions. So that's why I'm here now, try my best to present this like that, but um, that's all, it's, uh, it's, it's bigger than how it was played out to be. So. I think, Ramal, I appreciate that. Um, I think I think the the young people were probably more hurt than anything else because I think they were really looking forward to um, that space that they don't have. Um, but I think we have an opportunity now. I hope, as uh, as it was said, that it's clearer what it is that we uh, were asking for or are asking for at this point. Um, with the number of teens that we have. When COVID shut everything down, that was the most painful thing for teenagers. If any one of you uh, have had the experience with lots and lots of teens, was we couldn't do any of the activities we usually did to engage them. And I remember the first beautiful summer day, about 30 teens stood outside GEC begging me to come into the facility and I couldn't let them in because OCFS regulations for younger after school uh, children wouldn't allow um, for the uh, so when we finally were able to let them in, now we have to rotate, you know, who can come on Mondays and Wednesdays and who comes on Tuesdays and Thursdays, right, Ramel? So six and seven on Mondays and Wednesdays, this and this, and because we can't take everybody who wants to come at the same time. And we do recommend that they go to any other program in the area that's available to teens, um, but we still have a lot of young people out there um, who are really struggling for a place to call their own. So I have a couple of quick questions. Uh, first, uh, Ramel, having known you for a number of years, both in terms of your work with young people and as an artist in the community as well, I am going to buy a t-shirt that says Ithaca Weather. It's nice when it's nice. It's not when it's not. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't know if yes. I don't know if you meant that lyric, but I'm going to use that as well. Being printed by Biddy Box. <laughs> That's right. Um, one of the um, significant conversation pieces that happened just prior to the election, a lot of question after the election, was a conversation that uh, the board um, did not fully engage with the BJM community about this project. So I'm curious about what level of engagement, conversation, dialogue either has happened or should happen to even consider something like this because if I've heard correctly where it, it would mean a loss of lands temporarily right temporarily, yes. I, I, I will reiterate the temporarily but it still would mean loss of land so I'm trying to understand what that that's one of my questions um, the easement swap I get we have done before I'm saying this both for our new board members and for the community where the city and the school district have swapped pieces of land 
be it at Bell Sherman, uh, I have our expert here, and I didn't expect to see Brad, but he can tell me other places that we've done it. Uh, Chestnut Street. Chestnut and, Street, oh, LACS. And, so. and at LACS, then we swapped for a piece uh, behind Fall Creek. Behind Fall Creek, right. So this is not uncharted territory for the district to consider some sort of swap. I want to make sure that folks know that as well, that it has happened for a variety of reasons. Um, hopefully, usually mutually beneficial is the way, the reason why we engage in those sorts of swaps. Um, and then a couple other things for me would be um, things that we can discuss later on. I would be interested in what the fencing would look like um, for a building like this, in particular, giving some of the drawings. And what I do know from conversations that I've had with folks at BJM, and similar to um, Ramel, uh, our daughter went there, um, connected to BJM, our daughter went to GIAC, our grandbaby is now uh, part of the GIAC jumpers and is quite upset that she has not been able to go for two days. Uh, so you know, GIAC has a special place and the work that I consider myself doing. Um, but that also has met conversations with folks at BJM that um, should the city be thinking about, and this is to this not an accusation, Tim, and not to you, but considering about different traffic opportunities for Court Street. Uh, raised pedestrian walks, mid-street lighting so we can stop traffic and folks at BJM could travel safely to the Marcos Flats block. Uh, sometimes some folks have even asked about, you know, cutting off Court Street during for that block as well. Um, but just this idea that if this is going to take place, one of the ways in which to make it a full community is to make maybe mo both of those full blocks places for young people in different ways. And so that's a conversation that I receive pretty regularly about traffic control on that block to make it as safe as possible. And fairly clear suggestions from teachers, especially for our youngest students, about how they can tra traverse back and forth between the buildings and the properties in a way. So I'm not saying that these are connected, but in some regards they are connected. So I just want to make sure that they're out at the table. And I don't know how to address them. Some for me are longer down the road, right? Like we're nowhere near even talking about a fence, so I don't want to discuss that. But I do want to make sure that we've engaged with um, the teachers will be most impacted and the programs that will be most impacted, even if it's a temporary, you know, year loss of moving the garden and the outdoor classroom space. Um, so that's where I'm, that's where I'm at. Thank you. But, um, clarification question. We're not looking to get rid of the classroom space, the outdoor classroom space at the jam, right? No. Yeah. yeah. It would and, be disrupted for a year. Right. And that's one of the things that, um, I must say, uh, we, we as people <laughs> tend to overreact unnecessarily. And I saw with the whole voting process that all of a sudden people got on board the night before when we had ample time to review things. So going forward, hopefully people will review things in an earlier fashion than later and not on this. So that for clarification, because it was presented, uh, there were a few times. Um, if we look at the outdoor classroom space. I really wonder how many how many days out of a class out of the school year is that outdoor classroom utilized? That it was such a major impact, or BJM felt that it was a major impact. And that's just a rhetorical question right there. Because um, my two children went to BJM, and I enjoyed um, that time there. But yet. You know, in the weather in Ithaca, we're not outdoor, and the outdoor classroom isn't utilized all whatever number of days for the school year. So I, I'm glad um, this opportunity has arisen that GIAC is able to utilize that space. And I've been, I've partnered with GIAC through my work at Village at Ithaca, as well as community member at GIAC, and the space is definitely needed. <laughs> the space is definitely needed. And as a parent of a teenager, and I see that loss age group if we're not careful, especially when YMCA used to be downtown and then they moved up on the hill. So it was um, getting there delayed certain kids the opportunity to travel quickly there. So it would, it would be good for us to forge ahead and do this. I don't know what do we need to do at this point. Are we still just deliberating or... When are we moving ahead? <laughs> well, that raises my question. The process is as important as the destination. So I would also like to know what the city timeline is 
for this to take place or both best case scenario for a timeline and honestly not so good scenario for a timeline because um, also wondering if it does require us what does it mean we need to have additional conversation with building leaders with folks of that nature so I, I don't know if that's a question we can answer as well so connected to your question Karen about what needs to happen but I, I would also like to know what the timeline is when are these drawings you know enter to the state when do you get clearance when would construction begin? You know, I think all of those questions. Yeah, so we're behind schedule because we were hoping to get into construction this year with the idea that we could get the facility open in the spring or early summer of next year. Mm -hmm. um, now we're kind of, we have to solve this problem, I think, before we can really get too far forward. But if we could solve this in the next month or two, then we'd be in a position where we could be out to bid this late fall and get a contractor on board this winter and we could be in construction next year and hopefully have the facility open by late summer, early fall. That would be ideal, I think, at this point. So, but I, I think we're in a position where we would hope that we're not in a six-month you know, decision-making process here. That we could settle in a month or two, up to six weeks, something like that. So you find me, in the spirit of transparency, is that, a, I'm sorry, it sounded like somebody was about to say something. No, go ahead. Um, yeah, um, like Tim said, you know, we're really hoping within, you know, about a month, two will be pushing in for me that we're, we're able to move forward with this project. Um, going much more beyond that is, is I, <laughs> it'll come a point where I don't think that we'll be able to afford the project. In the spirit of transparency, when we first thought of this idea and looking around and seeing, you know, what do we do for a teen population and others and young adults, uh, this project rudiment, rudimentary, you know, budget was about $1.5 million. And it's like, okay, we can do this. We went out, we did a capital campaign, the community, because the community also will benefit greatly, really came forward. COVID hit and Three years later, we're looking at about a five plus million project. Beyond that, I don't know that I can shake any more trees. Um, writing grants, getting as much money as we can get in, because again, not for GIEC, but a project is gonna benefit this community in a massive way. Um, so we're really hoping that um, if there are more conversations to be had, we can have them quickly we can move forward with this because too much longer we're not going to be able to afford it. And that would be really um, unfortunate for for this community and for, and for our teams. <clears throat> Point taken. Thank you. Um, who knows, Sean, Dr. Brown, um, is can the board grant an easement or does it need to be Part of a yeah, that was going to be the question I had and uh, clarification that's needed. I, and I want to connect with our legal attorney. Uh, and if the board, if this needs to go to the voters, I mean, we're talking about whether it needs to be a special vote or waiting until the next. So there are questions um, after hearing the conversation tonight that we need to have answered. And we don't have to go to the table tonight to answer those questions. And I don't think they have the, the city attorney's not online at all. Yeah. So there are significant legal questions right. that need to be answered. So we, from both of us. my sense here is that um, the people in this room would like very much for this to move forward. Um, what we need to do is to find out what the next steps would be for the district to move this forward. Um, and go ahead, Tim. My understanding, just because we've had some conversations both with uh, Kate Reed and with our attorney, is that a swap is something that the district's board can do without going back out to the voters and a temporary easement for construction purposes as well. So obviously you need to confirm that here yourself directly, but mm -hmm. that's our understanding is that it's, it's a board decision. That is absolutely correct. The board um, can grant an easement or a land swap uh, at its discretion. The question becomes, given the recent election, how would that be viewed? And that's for me the reason it warrants a, converse, a, mm -hmm. a, a conversation. With the whole board? With that, absolutely. Yes. It would take the, 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 the facilities committee could not grant the. Exactly. Right? It would, it would have to, the facilities committee could put it up to the full board. Yeah. 
for a discussion and or vote if it so chooses. Could we get it on next week's agenda? Uh, that would be, what's next week, the 27th? Yes. I mean, could we? Of course, we could do. We could, we could, we could put anything on the agenda, right? That's a different question than um, having a vote to provide it. Well, we wouldn't necessarily have to vote next week, but we could have. Could it be a discussion? Tim, Leslie, bring everyone else up. If I may, um, sure. To not make some of the same mistakes we've made in the past. Um, I, uh, we haven't talked to folks at BJM. We haven't engaged the entire. Some of the feedback I and we were getting was that no one was talking about this other than some folks at a board meeting and some folks at, in the city. So I would be more, much more comfortable if we had a process that included a lot of other voices. Because whether we like it or not, it was very definitive to vote. And so any effort for us to do something, having a, a few months moved from both saying no, not to do it, and of course not having the clarification that we received tonight. So I think we need to have some kind of a process in place. And I know we're looking at two months, but give me a couple of weeks. <laughs> well, not even me, us as a community, to talk about this in a way where it won't be some before the vote, the night before the vote, people on Facebook saying not to vote for it or to come to the board meeting and say don't vote. Uh, I understand what you're saying. My thought is that by bringing it to the board next week or yeah. as soon as possible, that officially says the conversation is you're invited. It's a public meeting. Come and make comment. Come and listen to Tim, Leslin, you know, talk about why this isn't just some sort of crazy, you know, making a gym bigger. <laughs> yeah, some of the uh, yeah, uh, more informal, larger meeting at a school mm -hmm. will probably lend itself to much more dialogue than a board meeting mm -hmm. where we can't right. engage yeah. that kind of. I wonder if we can work with our building leader to have a yeah. conversation at BJM and invite other stakeholders mm -hmm. um, and have a temporary plan to have it on a board agenda at this first, the 13th, I want to say, is that our next board meeting in October? Whatever that be. The 11th. The 11th. Yeah. That's why I'm a political science man. Uh, I feel that that would actually give us a little bit more time to, and still be within a month if that was the decision. It doesn't need to go through multiple votes, no. but I do think it warrants a conversation. So a public information meeting before the board? Or, again, this is a conversation. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure that that's yeah. clear as well. Um, we could get to where I think folks may want to get to, but I also am aware, as Dr. Brown said, um, one of the pieces of feedback that I got is that it wasn't well known what the plans were that folks did not feel they were included in the conversation, and I would not like to repeat those mistakes if we're moving forward in this direction. And I want to make it also clear this is something that I personally wholeheartedly support. So I want that on record as well. And I'm aware that there needs to be a process for, for dialogue and conversation. So I'm comfortable with that if what you're proposing is a process of a public information meeting at BJM sometime in the next two weeks and then having a me another meeting for more dialogue and discussion at the board meeting on the 11th. Or at GIAC, <laughs> if GIAC so wants to host it there because knowing that at the school it might be challenging to change up their calendar at this time. Mm -hmm. No, and I'm happy, I know this is a school uh, district uh, the thing but I'm more than happy to be at the meeting the last time around we offered to come speak with uh BGM staff um around this uh, you know that didn't happen and so we had some you know non-clarity about you know what this was about so I'm more than happy at any time where you know meetings are set up and you know we're needed to come share and engage in conversation I'm more than happy to do that thank you so is this something that we instruct our superintendent to make happen and or <laughs> designee. Yeah, I like that. Hey, I well, like that. he could always delegate, of course. Well, that's why I said and yes. or designee. Yes. Right. So we all it. You got it. Okay. And we'll inform every all parties that know for the time being, Dr. Brown. All parties know for the time being? Yeah. Yeah. I'm Pointing at a couple people right now. <laughs> well, I was wondering because you weren't paying attention to me. That's <laughs> <laughs> nonverbal. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, everyone. And we're Thank moving you. on. In the
Okay. Um, I'm Amy Tai. I'm a parent at BJM, and we also have a teacher here from BJM. So we just wanted to know that we're obviously. We are. Okay. I don't know if we can. Like, Thank you. Edit. No, we, yeah. we're opening it up for public right. comment. So we'll really just we're... bring it back and share with our building leader that we'll try to spread the word. Because we're well, the word. I'm great. Well, uh, we sort of spread. already started, but she's not here. So we'll okay. Some more. Well, I think she, you know. Oh shit, okay. Yeah. Sure, and, then, yeah. and Jackie, you're on. All right, perfect. So I would I know that we as teachers want to talk about it and we're happy to anytime in the next two weeks as long as we Great. Yeah. I think the perfect place for that to start would be at a meeting. And I like the idea of having it at the school actually, because that says this is something that the school is involved in. Yeah. Um, and we are asking the school district to give up something in a sense. Not a whole lot, but something. Okay. So. Just clarification, this is something the community yes. is involved in. The yeah. community includes the school and the right. people. Right. Yeah. Okay, so thank you for coming. Sorry I didn't realize you were here no, earlier, but I this was more of a yeah, exactly. beginning. Yeah, exactly. I didn't want to say anything. It's okay. routine. So. Okay. <laughs> so we've got a plan. <laughs> Procedure. <laughs> we've got a plan. We're moving on to item 4.3, construction update. Hi everyone. Thanks everybody. Thank you so, much. so Cindy Doucet, who is often here to present, uh, is actually taking a well-deserved vacation that you. You. happened to coincide with our meeting. So what she did was she wrote up a summary of all the wonderful work that's happening. That's throughout the, one the district. We have yep, that's exactly here. right. The ICSD Capital Project Summer 2022 update. Um, I will say Chris Glauzitz is here from Tech Tech. They don't manage the construction, right? They designed everything that then Cindy ensures comes to fruition in partnership with Tetra Tech. Paul Alexander is here as well, who is uh, the Ithaca City School District representative for the Capital Project um, in collaboration uh, with Campus. But uh, one thing that I will uh, point out, I know that there was um, some conversation about uh, bathrooms, right? We are renovating those, and um, there were delays at one particular school, DeWitt, due to asbestos abatement. And so we, we sort of knew that was coming our way, and we knew that that uh, could potentially cause more traffic to have to flow to the bathrooms that were online, that remained online. And we didn't want that to happen. So we actually contracted to have um, temporary bathroom facilities near the space that was under construction so that we didn't cause overflow of traffic to the existing bathrooms. Um, and so those, again, I stress the word temporary. And they are um, uh, being used. I understand that uh, we have plans to keep them clean just like they would if they were inside the facility. Um, and there was a plan for management of student um, traffic usage of those bathrooms and staff have been using them and they will go away uh, in, in a few weeks as soon as we're able to get those other bathrooms back online. So that was just one thing that I wanted to mention um, and that was due to asbestos abatement um, and that is common practice I will say in um, Sean's tenure, Brad's tenure, right? like across the district, Paul, we can probably count almost every single project. We just we just know that that does take longer. So, but I did hear you say they will be gone in a couple of weeks. That is correct. Okay, that is correct. This is not something that will go into the winter. Very good. I thought we, have to, we should soften our language, but I'm gonna let that slide for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> we are planning for it not to go longer. Uh, but as we know, um, I also feel it's important to say the community folks have had some questions about a couple of projects. Uh, almost every project that I know, especially in large port part because of COVID, um, is experiencing both supply delays um, in addition to uh, possible construction delays as well. And so things that we were much more ahead of schedule on the last time we went through a capital project may not move with the same level of um, expedited speed that we've experienced. I do have a question about um, our pool uh, and where we are. I didn't. I don't think I saw it in the update. Did I miss it? About where, what's taking place? What's happening? Or... People are swimming. 
There's, right. there's, a, there's a meet going on right now. That's right. That's so right. I, I walked the official in. Heather, we should have had a party for that alone. I mean, uh, yeah, it is amazing. Yeah. Yes, and Chris, I want to just say thank you for being a skateboarder um, because perhaps one of the most creative solutions that I heard to get us into a place that it was a slip resistant temporarily until we waited for the grit paint to come to paint the apron of the pool to prevent slipping was done by a skateboarder who said, hey, there's this tape. Samantha, come on over and meet me and let's try this out. And went to the skate shop and, and I think the guy said, okay, sure. And so thank you, Chris, that was brilliance in action and we got kids in the pool faster. So, thanks, thank you. There was some question about a tennis court fence somewhere as well. Ah, yeah, so tennis court, Heather, is that part of your update? Because that's a daily operations question, not a capital project question. Um, it wasn't, but it can be. Can we transition, Heather, to the facilities update? Might you just give a little, quick little tennis fence okay topic? Okay. I'm not the chairperson. Go for it. Oh, I just have one right. question. Sure. Just one question. With the with regard to the capital project, um, what was budgeted originally? Was this project budgeted to start this summer, or um, and then um, what was budgeted <laughs> when it was budgeted? How much over did we go? Because so, knowing um, prices of items purchased. Well, funny you should say we're really planning for that um, for phase three. Everything that we plan for is much more expensive. Um, Part one of phase one last summer, right? I mean, I think Cindy has been keeping track of the budget. We do build in contingencies, incidentals. Um, and so since this project isn't completed yet, this phase, uh, phase two, we have next summer as well, we can give an update, uh, Karen, for you. I, we can do a budget update next time when Cindy's here. Um, we do that every now and again for this group because we want to not only track where we, where we are currently, but how much we have left to spend for the remaining dreams and visions and thoughts and planning. So um, if that's okay, if we could do that next month, that would be great. To that, and the, the question for me though, Karen, is that we will not go over the allotted budget. Once one hundred twenty million. Because we've been doing it in increments, and what we'll decide in phase three, and maybe even phase four, right, it'll be smaller and smaller opportunities for us to do, but we will not run over the budget any time or we, we should not run over the budget legally i don't think we can <laughs> yeah, we're authorized to spend 120 million we plan we have phases for that and we keep recalibrating those phases as we move forward so any impact would come to things yet to be submitted to state education department okay sorry to throw us out of sync here are there any fantastic more questions or comments on the construction update before we move on and hear anything else about facilities update. So, yes. Would you allow a comment from the Phoenix Gallery? Uh, I will. So I'm, I, I continue to attend the OACM meetings uh, with, for the district, the okay. owner, architect, construction manager meetings. And I'm I'm here to just express a concern. Your construction manager had two full-time people on site. Now they're at one. And I'm concerned about loss of momentum uh, there. I'm starting to sense a loss of momentum. And this is not critical of, of the individual who's still here, Cindy, um, but about campus. And I'm, I'm worried about that. Um, and I, I wanted to bring that to your attention. I think that with what you're paying campus, they owe you that person. And it doesn't have to be the person who was here, but they need someone here. And I just want you to know from perspective, you know, I'm an outside, I can come in once a month and listen to the updates and so forth. Um, I'm worried that there's a loss of momentum there. And some of that, I think you're seeing in things that aren't getting done. Um, the person who was, there previously, his job was pretty much to beat people over the head and try and 
get things done on time, and I'm not sensing that's happening. Now, the last meeting, I didn't, I didn't get that sense at all, that that sort of chasing the contractors, chasing the subcontractors was happening at the same one. And so I wanted to bring that concern and suggest you might want to have a conversation with the management, the construction management. Which thing is that? Yours, okay. Amanda? Okay. Um, what is OAM? OAC. OAC, Owner Architect Construction Management okay. Meeting. Those meetings happen once a month, Thursdays from 9.30 to noon, uh, both online and in York. Um, we have not traditionally invited all board members, but any board member that wanted to attend had the opportunity to attend. Uh, Jill, it will definitely be added to your calendar as the okay. chair of this committee, and I will continue. I've, I've been attending more recently. Um, Brad's been attending from the start. Right. Okay. Thank you. And all right. my apologies, maybe Amanda or Chris, what we can do is invite all, at least all facility board member, committee members and uh, notify our board colleagues of this opportunity as well for folks who may want to. Thank you. Heather, anything else? Um, before the May 5th, did you want me to? About the um, item 4.4 facilities update? Um, I think that's. Is that your call? I don't know. Is it, is it me? You. All right. oh, you had there. It says it's a daily it's operations facility update. Do you mind? Okay. Us and, uh, no, I don't. I just us? I get a little bit confused because I didn't bring my paper with me. So That's all right. I'm trying, trying to. I'm trying to okay. in there. All right. All right. Uh, please read me. It'll be. Uh, um, I did share a, a slide, and it's uh, sometimes um, stylistically kind of Storytown USA here. Um, all right. Um, so I want to uh, dial back just a little bit to touch on. There was a question regarding the tennis courts. Mm -hmm. And um, with your permission, I'd like to give some context about that. There's visible damage to the tennis court, and it occurred uh, early in July after a storm. And at that time, we had uh, Brenda Miller, who is our uh, crew chief, caution tape it and then remove um, the, the nets so that we would stay off it. And then we called in, uh, we called in insurance, called Amanda, and also called uh, Whitmore Fence Company. And when they came down and took a look at it, um, they said that uh, the damage, what it revealed is that there's actually a structural problem with a whole tennis court. So um, yay, that only one wall was broken, right? Like the, so some of the poles actually were severed. And they said, um, here are your scenarios, we can um, we're booked right now. We can schedule for a complete replacement. That's complicated by the fact that there's conduit that runs along the top of the tennis court to run the lights, and that was recently installed. So they said one option is doing that. Um, and uh, another option is to replace one side, and, and the two sides that we know, one is visibly compromised, and we know the other one is structurally compromised. And if we, if we do that, uh, both of those scenarios would have ended the tennis season. So I called Samantha and Matt and, and said, here's what we can do safely. There are six tennis courts. We can have four of the six safe and functional for the entirety of the season. We can get it uh, with more, uh, actually visited three times and, and uh, brought an engineer and made a plan and they gave us a couple different scenarios. The one that we felt moving forward that would honor the community, I know that sports seasons, including the pool and various things, have been in a state of upheaval. Um, we made a decision that four was better than zero and that um, we would find spaces to work around that. Um, we have a plan in place that when the, um, when the tennis season ends and I get the word, um, Whitmore is already constructing. It's a custom fence and it is structurally sound and it's different than the existing fence. I don't, going back, I've seen pictures of that. Paul, you might know how old that is, uh, the existing tennis court fence. It's, it's been there a while. It's, yeah, so, so we're gonna, 
We're going to acknowledge that it's been there a while. The other concern was that we didn't want to damage the, the playing surface. So any repair work, we want to make sure that the tennis season was as uninterrupted and unimpacted as we could. So what will happen when the tennis season is over in a nutshell is that um, Whitmore will have already constructed and have ready to transport and replace the fence in its entirety, including uh, the wiring. It will be structurally sound. It will be capable of displaying the, um, the windproof uh, banners and some of the um, branding that is there currently for athletics. So part of that too was uh, going all the way back to see you know where did their bad stuff come from and what is it designed to do and how can we support that and then kicking that to the engineer. So um, there is a light at the end of the tunnel and we picked the lesser of all the evils um, to keep our athletes and scholars safe. Does anyone want to argue that zero is better than four? <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Four's better than zero. No, no, no. Oh, you, okay. you had it right. Yeah, okay. okay. Sounds good. Okay. How are we communicate? I'm, I'm the one getting the email from family, so we're upset mm -hmm. because we have four instead of six. Mm -hmm. And so thank you for sharing this, because this yeah. gives me some information to share yeah. back with those families. So I'll be sharing how we communicated the rationale behind why we are keeping the season going up to four. four, four. I see. So. Um, the conversations uh, with me and athletics have, have encapsulated that. It hasn't gone, I think it didn't go maybe in, in far enough in the right direction. So that's a learning for me to make sure that things are communicated in the, in the wider community, that we know that our school grounds are, are open for our community to use. And um, probably it felt really bad for them not to have any information about that. So um, that, is that something that we can add in the next edition of the Insider? Yeah, we, can there be a half page or something that captures that? Or even on the website, big picture of the tennis court and say, hey, yeah. if you're wondering. Yeah. Um, that's, these are all good ideas. Thank you. <laughs> um, is that, are we giving I apologize. So is that something that we're going to do or they're just a good idea? <laughs> I'm trying to um, we're having a lot of conversation about talking. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like there's hand signals, yeah. nods. Yeah, we like have to look to Paul to see if we're, you know, <laughs> what kind of baseball signals are we giving here? Okay, that's helpful. Thanks. So that's the, the tennis court. As far as the facilities itself, um, I threw a second slide up, um, and this is, uh, um, I think this will be, yeah, this will be shared here, and I can take you through it as. It is similar in format um, to what I shared last time in that the left side of the slide is largely intact. That, um, that instead of summer 22, what have we been doing to prepare spaces for teaching and learning? Um, it's fall 22. And again, just a reminder that, um, that the facilities should be a collaborator and thought partner with the care and keeping of the teaching and learning environments that engage and educate and empower. So, our job really is to connect and to support um, the mission and vision of the district. Um, and this particular story time involves five pictures. So we will start, uh, I guess, no particular order. There's one that's marked with a red lightning bolt. And um, that red lightning bolt is actually our very own Amanda Verba on the floor at Caroline. Not in the picture. Um, I mean, she's with Karen Arnold, who is that building's uh, educational leader, not in the picture, standing off the side. Chris, were you there for that one or no? I know Jairus was there, who's our, uh, our custodian. I was there. And what we're doing is some problem solving around supply chain issues and making it so that um, the, the physical education instruction could take place for the children and in a way that the physical educator was comfortable. And what that involved with, uh, in addition to a lot of like looking at floor space and planning, it involves some collaboration with the high school and that did. eventually we had a mini brainstorm right there. We ended up calling Jason Trumbull here at the high school, picking up some dividers so there's collaboration between buildings. Brenda Miller and her crew trucked them to Caroline, helped Jarrah set them up, and that provided um, what the physical educator needed and what the students needed to be safe. So that was a collaboration of, um, of administrators and then various working arms of facilities. The little Pac-Man is down the corner. Um, it's kind of hard to see because it's behind the screen, but you see the giant green stripe, and that's really hard to miss. Um, <laughs> this is uh, um, evidence of community partnership, right, and doing good things. Like part of, I think, the culture of love is really, um, you know, putting feet to your words. 
and putting things in action. So one of the things uh, that Karen Arnold was working on before she left the high school to go to Caroline is she was collaborating with community partners to create a safe um, bike lane, and that was that was very well marked. And that involved um, some of our staff uh, collaborating with um, Karen Cudahy, I think her name is, from the city, and. Um, one in a row, right, Amanda? That's my street. That's right. Got it. I got a name right. Um, and actually, what this uh, there's a, an educator here in the district, uh, Kelda McCurk, who reached out and said that they would really actually like this to extend um, through Boynton and out the back. So um, again, it is collaboration and finding pathways to yes, so that um, our community is um, safer and is, is better served. Uh, purple smiley face. That's a super boring story, and that is uh, one of our uh, maintenance um, professionals, Greg Lori, is, um, I don't know if you know, I, I know you all know Murph 13, right? You're like, woo, 13. Um, but what you might, may or may not know is that all those filters have to be um, individually measured to fit in the, in the dump that they go in, right? So there's many projects, many sizes. So Greg is in charge of uh, kind of measuring putting a schedule, but what he had done is he has been carefully documenting everything on about, uh, I'm rounding up, about 6,000 spreadsheets, I think. Um, and what we did was partner with technology, and we have him working with Sharon Nelson, who's actually helping him consolidate that information into a living, breathing document so that we don't have to reinvent the wheel all the time to keep the air um, safe and at the quality that we promised. So collaboration between uh, technology and our maintenance staff. Um, so things like when the filters need to be swapped out? When, when, where, and what size uh -huh. goes where. Because you can't just grab a box of filters and be like that. Okay. It, it's literally like that eight foot strip gets these three filters and they're in this box with this size and here's the location. Okay. And um, so there's a, there's a lot of moving parts and a lot of different sizes and Greg has taken the initiative to organize that so that, um, so that uh, teaching and learning environments are safe. Um, the circle with the, the X in the middle. So this one's really hard to see, so I'll just tell you a little bit longer story because you're trapped here with me. Um, we had a student that came forward to us and her family said, um, she uses a wheelchair and we need the furniture out so she can get her wheelchair under it. And so initially the family said, that, you know, that's, that's kind of what we need. And one of our maintainers, Sean Ward, actually attended um, the, the nighttime orientation. So he came after hours, met with the family, and I, mean, I think he ended up even hanging out at their house um, to, you know, to take any chair that she could be in. And his solution wasn't to raise up a single piece of furniture. He and the family actually, it's, it's hard to see, but they actually removed the front panel in all of the spaces she was gonna be with. So really, no matter where she wants to be, she fits and her furniture is the same as the person next to her and that is the um, like truly uh, inclusive culture that we're trying to build. So that was a really lovely collaboration between uh, Tara Kaiser, who spearheaded uh, that charge and connected the family with maintenance and maintenance coming up with a, a better solution than anyone had even put forward was to just modify every space in this building. Which yeah. school is this? This is at DeWitt. Uh, we also took the meeting with a family and the maintainer came back to us and said, hey, um, you know, obviously this child is gonna move through our system and that allowed us to meet with campus and with Chris and design spaces for, um, for all students coming through and Tara Kaiser had a wonderful quotable moment. She said, ADA is a law, but ADA isn't enough and every single child at deserves to have their needs met and families recognized and in place where it is a welcoming learning environment. So a um, little teamwork there. And then the last one is the pool. So that's fun. This was this was actually taken uh, this afternoon. Um, the record boards are back up. Um, Jeff has been working to um, make sure that the pool is all set. On the scissor lift is Sean and we actually had Stephanie Valletta um, who was really championing to make sure that that things are as ready as they can be. So um, that is, um, those are the ways that facilities are heading into this fall. Terrific.
my story time is now concluded. Thank you. As you were. As I did in my own board meeting. <laughs> <laughs> not tonight. Not tonight. Ours is next week. But, um, so, not going anywhere, but I will just. Karen or Sean? Oh, I just appreciate the updates, um, and in particular, the um, having been on the board long enough, uh, realizing that when we first get information, um, there's a necessary need to receive that information, and oftentimes there is um, a reason behind uh, what we find. So the tennis fence, for me, is a prime example. Uh, folks wanted an immediate solution, uh, deserve an immediate solution, and then when we start having discussion about the details, we realize it's always much more complex than just fixing a fence. Uh, so I just, I really appreciate that example and that explanation helps me when I have to answer questions for folks in the community as well about there's a reason why we're down to four courts and it's not because people aren't taking their job seriously or trying to get things done. It actually is just the opposite. Uh, we're trying to protect the needs of young people. Uh, and so I just thank you. For, I really appreciate that explanation. Thank you, Heather, for um, reiterating the community collaboration and the whole process, like with the bike lane and, and even the um, students' desk that needed the accessibility. Because I, I did hear from some community members saying, well, when, when there's construction happening at different schools, why aren't we able to provide input? And I reminded them, well, there's the Let's Portal as well as speaking with your respective PTA and getting a community conversation going with the building administrator. So this is just reminded that there is co community collaboration that's happening so, with facilities update. Okay. Because I wonder when I came and saw the, the bright green bike, <laughs> bike, I was like, what is It's this? subtle, like, right? It's very, very subtle. 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 <laughs> Right, moving on to 4.5, Chris, future phases. Chris, thanks Chris. for um, being so flexible. I told Chris to prep something from 45 minutes to five minutes, depending on how much time he's going to have. And as always, he's ready. So, could we just have Chris have a microphone and just do like a stand up comedy? That was good. Like he did during, like, around COVID that one time. That was late night. That was, that was so really fun. Chris is his best at like the 9.30 hour. It's always great to follow QAnon in a meeting. So. <laughs> 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 and Chris, because we so appreciate the work you do, we gave you a bag of... Yes. Uh, <laughs> yes. And, uh, just want to make sure you're part of it. Uh, thank you for, for the time. So I'll, I'll just run through quickly um, some of the future, uh, the future work. Um, so to, to step back for a moment, um, and, and just lean in a little bit to what Sean said earlier. Um, the, the $120 million capital project referendum that was approved by the voters in 2019 uh, is broken down into many phases. And some of those phases have been bid and are nearly complete, like what we're calling phase one. Um, some are bid and very much in the middle of construction, like is phase two. Um, and some are not yet bid. Uh, so we're really kind of in the middle there. And so the, that budget, um, is always kind of evolving and we're always kind of going back to check on that and make sure that um, as as cost escalation um, in, increases um, that as a team we're, we're keeping an eye on that and trying to anticipate um, what those costs will be what what is known what is unknown and how to just make sure that we stay on the right side of, of that budget so Cindy Doucette does a great job of, of funneling all that together as we have uh, many projects that go into that um, so, I'll just share a few images um, about what we can expect from uh, present and future projects. So, you may have, if you've driven by South Hill recently, you may have seen a lot of dirt and a lot of trucks and, and, and things happening there. Um, and we're really excited to, um, to be seeing some initial improvements in the, um, in the traffic flow. Uh, 96B as you go south out of town. I've heard some good um, anecdotes about that. So, um, so that part of that is um, is functioning. Um, you will also, if you if you go in there, see a large hole in the ground, and that's will turn into what we're seeing on the screen here, which will be in addition uh, to that 
uh, to that west side of the building that will flip the main entrance to that part to match up with the uh, what is the public drop off, the parent drop off, the public parking area, so you don't have to sort of walk all the way around the building um, with security concerns and the inconvenience that that entails. So, so the we, buses would still be at the the buses would remain on the on the east end. On the east end okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, this addition and and um, uh, renovation of the you know the stairs and, and that portion of the parent drop off uh, will be coming into shape uh, over the winter as the construction progresses and and next summer as well when we when. The, the flood of parents abates uh, for the summer. We can get back in and do that, do the rest of that site work. So that's one of the things that um, is kind of in construction, but we'll we'll be seeing something a little bit uh, coming up out of the ground a little bit more. So, um, moving on to so this is this is what we're calling phase two, which is this this um, twenty million or so that is under construction. Uh, so also there's an addition going on at LACS. This is a before photo. Some of you remember these lovely. Uh, presentation of, of, of uh, duct work and things on the on the front entrance of the building. Um, right now, there's a, there's quite a bit of construction happening there as well, and so the next image will give us an idea of what that will look like. Thanks, Trisha. Um, again, this is an addition to improve security to the building and and um, and just oversight on who is coming and going from the building, so they can they can manage who's in the building. Um, as there is quite a lot of that, uh, volunteers and students coming in and out of LACS as well, giving them uh, an area where, where students can, can be out of the elements uh, for when that weather is not okay to be outside, as we know, uh, but still be able to have the parents come in and be able to see, uh, see the kids and they can, they can uh, drop off. This also allows some increased functionality for the black box theater, which is that Brick volumes are on the right side of this image, uh, so when they have events, they can have a lobby and go straight into that. Uh, so it'll improve functionality in, in a number of ways. Um, this addition, similarly, will be coming into shape over the winter and um, and into next summer. Here's a, an image of the inside of that. Uh, we've got Vox down at the end there uh, on the glass, as well as uh, a green wall on the right with with the. Uh, with the video screen that tells the community um, what kind of events are happening. Okay, moving on to Boynton and DeWitt. Again, this is this is all, still a lot of the work on phase two that um, we've started on and will be coming uh, coming into completion over the next year or so. Um, both Boynton and DeWitt are receiving a similar renovation to their theater spaces. Okay, so if you've been in, in one of them in a while, you you'll uh, maybe you know smell that shag carpet on the wall from the 70s and uh, uh, and and understand that like this open to the corridor right that's not a great um, attribute for teaching and learning the way that the, the schools need to use these spaces now so the renovation would allow those to become teaching spaces in addition to theatrical spaces and um, with the intention that uh, it's, it's very flexible and sort of a black box kind of theater so you can um, you can bring your imagination to what sort of events you can host in that space. Uh, so DeWitt is ongoing right now. Uh, Boynton is scheduled to begin next summer. Um, so we, we, you know, with the construction manager, um, they were intimately involved in figuring out a, a, a good way to schedule those, one from uh, functionality within the district. So while DeWitt is under construction, you still have Boynton, and then you, know, you can flip flop those uses uh, to not take both of those theatrical spaces offline at the same time. So we're excited to see those come together. Uh, yeah, here it is with the lights off. It's a little bit less exciting, but it gives you that it's a sense of drama. Uh, then we have, I think that maybe is it for phase two. Okay, so uh, key, in keeping with the multiple phases of the project, we've got uh, phase three in various um, subcategories. Uh, but some of that includes a replacement of all the windows at, at BJM. Uh, those are uh, aging out. A lot of them don't function very well, so we'll be replacing those as well as some needed masonry improvements uh, around the building, as well as the, the top um, parapet coping, which is uh, a little bit the worse for wear uh, in the weather that we have here in freeze-thaw cycles. 
as well. Enfield Elementary um, is receiving some bathroom upgrades. So we're trying to travel around the district and improve bathrooms wherever we can. We're trying to kind of wedge one into every project. There's a roof, there's a bathroom, and then there's something that's maybe a little more interesting to teaching and learning, but uh, really trying to balance the, the, uh, what the buildings need to do to support students. Um, so there'll be some improvements to the facade there, and I think we'll see that on the on the next image there. We had a couple different you know color schemes that the community is uh, is uh, working with the building leadership to you know kind of get with their um, different color you know selections for the panels that will uh, kind of brighten up that that entrance for the students. So when they come there, they've got um, uh, sort of an updated look to that. We'll be keeping those murals um, that are there that were worked by the students, so those will be removed and reinstalled um, in the new facade. Um, as, as part of that also, we're, we're doing a little piece over on the, uh, the public entrance as well to uh, help the, the wayfinding on that site, because sometimes people show up and they're a little confused about which, uh, which place to go to. But if they, if they get in the correct driveway, then it makes it a lot easier. So I'm trying to guide them that way. Um, so phase 3B um, includes uh, several pieces, one of which is at the high school. Um, and that includes uh, expanding the lake source cooling. So currently, Cornell University, which installed uh, lake source cooling pipes, you have two, I think they're 42 inch diameter high pressure pipes running along the side of Lake Street. Um, and at the time that was built, Ithaca High School got a tap onto that, so has been enjoying uh, lake source cooling for, for several decades now. So we plan to expand that um, and extend the cooling to the rest of this building. Part of that will be in, in, um, replacing the HVAC control system as well as a lot of the HVAC equipment. So. Um, we're excited to, to bring a little bit better climate control to this building um, starting in 2024. It'll probably take about three summers to get all this work done. It's quite a bit of work, but should follow on the work that we've done at Boynton and DeWitt recently um, to help uh, replace aging systems just to allow those mechanical uh, pieces of equipment to, op to function correctly. Uh, You're saying this building, you mean the board building as opposed to the whole high school complex? Uh, I'm sorry. I mean, I mean the whole high school complex. Uh, okay. Yeah. So, so what this color coded thing? I'm not going to go into it. But we're we're um, in the process of basically this is a large enough project that we need to split this one into two pieces just for the uh, the practicality of getting it done and and working uh, with the aid ability and a lot of other factors that we consider. Uh, so that's coming. Uh, another big piece of this is uh, about 10,000 square feet of renovation of the STEM suite. So we're really excited about that to give Code Red a new updated home and allow that program and those teaching spaces to uh, come up to another level. They're working in uh, spaces that were originally designed in, in the mid-60s. So uh, we're excited to have that. That will also include a small addition on the north side and an addition that links um, Area C and the athletic spaces uh, through the building to allow students to kind of have a new circulation path through the building and, and get them past these STEM spaces um, in partially in the hopes to just increase engagement in those programs. There's there are also some some renovations to the parking lot out here. But here are a couple images that we've um, that we've put together for that STEM space. So right now those are. Those are four uh, kind of spaces that we're really clearing out and making a central space with some smaller classrooms off of that. Uh, we've had some great sessions with the students uh, and, uh, and some VR technology that uh, uh, allowed us to do some visioning and really get some feedback from them. Uh, Chris, if I'm not mistaken, some of this conversation we about the STEM spaces have included meeting with the STEM teachers at the high school as well? Absolutely, absolutely. Many, many meetings with, uh, with Scott Regal, um, and Ian Crywe, the two teachers who are, are central to that. So yeah, we're going back and forth with them quite a bit um, over over the course of many many meetings to develop the plans and adjust things and change things around and uh, really try to fine tune this with the teaching and learning and the type of projects that happen specifically in those spaces. Um, so the next image shows a, a classroom that we've talked about and it looks fairly simple, but um, if you go to the next one, Trisha, thanks. Uh, basically, the, uh, you know, understanding that the, a lot of the projects they do, they're on the computer, and then they have to turn around and assemble a part on a robot or something like that, uh, and then come back and sort of this back and forth between 
uh, between the computer work and, and some light, um, cleaner kind of work, uh, keeping the, the dust-laden stuff in a separate section. So, uh, conversations about that. Um, other parts of uh, Phase 3B include a renovation to the Fall Creek Playground. Um, so we'll be engaging in some community uh, conversations around that with the Fall Creek community as well as the building leadership um, through this year um, to identify what, uh, what, that, what that space looks like. Um, there'll be some, some minor renovations to the cafeterias as well at, at, uh, at Fall Creek and at BJM to improve the lighting mostly and, and uh, just kind of lighten up those spaces. So Chris, before you proceed, I have here, and I'd be happy to send to you a list of 14 playgrounds that my grandbaby has ranked. Okay. Uh, 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 it's it. fine, it's Love the it. best playground ever, or uh, we're not going back, Papa. Those okay. Those kind of things. And I say this because uh, the Fall Creek Playground is one of the ranked, it's one of the best ever. All uh, right. So uh, given the size and scope and the use of that playground, I think there'd be a number of, community, of much community interest and what we do with that playground specifically, yeah. given one, its history with a local company, but also the it is one of the larger playgrounds that we have um, on district site. So just to, again, if you want the scientific study, I'll send it your way as well. So I we, want to know what the Stewart Park um, renovations, how she went for those. It, now that it's fully open, it's beyond the best ever. It's okay, great. Right. I'm relieved. Okay. It's, it's, it's got a water, it's got a splash pad. Well, yeah. you, but, but, so, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. I'm sure there's been conversations, but I just want to make sure. Yep. Uh, my, my boys grew up playing on that playground as well. So, I understand its, its position in the community, and that's part of why, as we were planning this project, we said, you know, we need to have a, a a process around this that involves the community. Gotcha. So that we'll be hearing more about that soon. Uh, we're partnering also with a, uh, a Cornell professor uh, who studies this, um, and we'll be bringing her in as a as a consultant to um, to to manage that process and get that feedback and, and make some design recommendations for that. And that's it for for me today. Sorry, I went a few minutes over. That looks like a boring playground to me. I don't know. That's a classroom. Oh, oh, it looks like a great classroom. Yeah. Looks like a, oh, sorry. It's, like a great, it's an amazing classroom space. That's a, that's a, that's a Bell Sherman. Is it? Oh, no, no, no sorry, that's Key Guides. Very good. Thank you. Thank Questions you. for? Well, on this topic. Yeah, the um, Boynton and DeWitt Theater, are those removable chairs? Yeah, those those uh, risers will remain, but generally as is, um, and those chairs will be removable. Yeah, just loose chairs. And of course, you'll have left-handed as well as right-handed because your picture just had right-handed. Well, the uh -oh. furniture has not yet been selected, so we have the opportunity. Whether uh, you know, initial conversation um, has started a debate about whether we want tablet arms or not tablet arms, for example. So um, there's more to or to be figured out about that. I noticed that too, Karen. I was going to say something. Figured that we were going to stop photos. We can mirror the image for you. We have all the left hand. Or I see now how it's best that you choose. Right, yeah. Other few places I haven't done. All right. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. It's exciting. Thank you. Future topics for our next agenda. I don't know what the timeline with the city. We would bring back uh, the topic that we started the meeting with because I think facility would occur after um, that meeting, right? Um, obviously, we'll have a more in-depth conversation about the budget uh, for the capital projects. And you can actually walk us through um, you know, uh, their plan. And I would imagine that campus construction would want to be able to respond to uh, the comments that were made about uh, their management of the construction. Um, and I would want to be prepared for statements as well. We've been, I, I feel Sydney is just a fantastic resource and we could not be happier working with her. Um, for me, this is both connected and disconnected from any conversation with uh, the city and the school district possible sub surface land swap 
could be a continued conversation about traffic abatement on Court Street uh, between Marcos Flats and uh, BJM or Edmonton City. So I'd like to keep that on as an agenda item for a future conversation just to make sure that conversation is also front and center mm -hmm. about how we're trying to make sure young people can cross that street safe, more safely. And if you're ever wrong at around 4 or 5 o'clock, you know it's, it's difficult. Well, there's no reason why it has to be um, subsumed under the the other issue. I That's think correct. I think it's important enough on its own. Yep. So why don't we have it? Why don't we open a discussion on safety improvements or ideas for that area? That that would require the city because the traffic flow. And yep. Buffalo Street is an emergency throughway, but Court Street is a plan. I can assure you that the city will have strong feelings about traffic all <laughs> in that area. We've been down this path. So I've been down this path for 30 I'm, years now. <laughs> I'm hoping maybe we're in a different time frame to have some different collaborations. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, and are we going to talk about electrical buses anytime in the future? So Dan, are you up for an update at the next facilities meeting? Uh, the next meeting, yes. certainly. Next next meeting. We would we would love We can this. talk a little bit about some of the really great work that's happening around um, the sustainability and the, the request for the students. We've got oh, we can do a whole update for you. Great. great. Oh yeah. And the, the grants that we're applying for and all those things, yeah. We can talk about that. So, to that end, again, just something that we have not always been the best at, so in part to respond to Karen's question, and I'm looking at Dr. Brown and our phenomenal communication team, that some of that information should be put out in advance or to remind folks that we will be discussing this at this particular meeting to invite people to participate because we don't, we have not always communicated well the various steps that we're taking around sustainability. So not for just for us to get an update, but to make sure it's a little more widely known as well. Sorry, Doc. Yeah, no, I, um, by way of clarification and sort of the key, we are hoping to put out something after every meeting and then something to preview future meetings. So uh, I, we're taking notes seriously over here with hopes that we can summarize and put some things out to our community, Great. including the future topics. Great. Do I hear a motion for adjournment? Karen? I second. All in favor? Favor. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you all. Very